There was this very dark, sinister cabal of individuals who began to emerge uh, with uh, Herbert Walker Bush. One of, the, one of the major things Herbert Walker Bush did, the, the Republican Party had been the party of peace up until that time. It was the Democrats who took us to war, uh, the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and then all of a sudden, Herbert Walker Bush, who had been the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, not much difference than being the head of the KGB, same type of thing, he flipped it. He said, oh, you know, we now have this three-legged stool where, you know, one of the legs of conservatism is, is uh, basically war. And, and then his son carried it on and the Democrats, which had always been a war organization, except during the Vietnam where, where some of their base rose up because they were threatened with the draft. Other than that, they've always been the, the force of war. <clears throat> so now you have the Democrats who favor war and the Republicans who favor war. There is no peace party any longer. And this is, this is a great tragedy. It's such an honor to have you as a guest, Senator Richard Black on the Herland Report. You have an amazing track record uh, and a career as a military colonel, then as a pilot in the U.S. Marines in Vietnam. Then you retired from the military and from various positions in the Pentagon in 1994. Uh, then you embarked on a political career and you have become one of the most renowned and well-respected men in the United States as a senator. Uh, with a broad understanding and a remarkable knowledge on how the world works outside of the U.S. Uh, and an understanding that has earned you this great respect. We're so honored to have you. Well, I'm very pleased to be here and, and uh, very grateful for what you do, for your global reach and your ability to uh, to speak the truth uh, because we seldom hear the truth from the global media, the mainstream media. Uh, so much of what they publish, particularly in the area of foreign affairs, there, there is so little of reality, so, so little of genuine substance that it is uh, organizations like yours that give some hope that we can inform the people and perhaps we can move eventually towards a situation of peace. You know, I, I had a military career and uh, uh, I, I fought uh, very fierce battles in Vietnam. I was, I was wounded, my radio men were killed right beside me. Uh, as a pilot, uh, my plane came back with bullet holes through the fuselage on four different times. Um, <clears throat> but I began to, to realize the tremendous disconnect <clears throat> between the people who fight, who, who are gallant, who are just magnificent people, and the people who send them to war. Uh, the people who send them to war are playing a game of global chess. They have no interest in the American soldiers and Marines and the other services. They have no interest in the, uh, the welfare of America. I'm talking as an American. Their, well, their, their interest is in power, wealth, and how they can fit into this global enterprise which promotes war throughout the world. And it does it 
through very deceptive means. They control the media. The media is, is very much like a pyramid that starts with the Associated Press and goes down. Because uh, many, many media sources can't, uh, they can't have reporters around the world, so they look to the Associated Press. So that becomes truth. And so, so it has made me a bit of a cynic because I have seen, I have spoken to the people, I have spoken to common people, and I've spoken to leaders, and I, I have watched what's gone on and seen how we have moved to overthrow governments that were no threat to us, to intervene in countries where the people, it's, it's you know, it's, it's the job of the Venezuelans to sort out. I, I may not like the Venezuelan government, but it's not my business to decide what sort of government they should have. And the same thing with a with, uh, hundred other countries. And so um, it's, it's a bit unnerving. As a very, very patriotic American who has shed blood on the battlefield, and I've, I've lain unconscious in the, in the sun of Vietnam for lack of blood, and then you, you risk your life a your life hundred times, and you discover that the people who make the wars, who orchestrate, who plan the wars, really don't care about you. They don't care about the people who come back in body bags. They don't care about, they don't care about the country. It would be one thing if they sacrificed the troops for the benefit of the nation. That, that makes some sense. But they're not concerned with the benefit of the nation. They're concerned with some greater global enterprise and where they can fit in and how they personally can gain enormous wealth and power. And this is, this is uh, probably the, the, the big lesson that I have learned through many, many years in the Pentagon, in the, in the field of battle, and, and uh, studying what has gone on, particularly in the Middle East. After 1989, the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, we saw a rise of the neoconservative movement in the United States with Paul Wolfowitz, Dick Cheney at the time, and, and there's kind of feeling that uh, this was the end of history and liberal progressive democracy had won the battle. Um, to what degree do you see the neocon movement as the beginning of the end for the American hegemony and world power? The, the end of the Cold War was, was such an historic opportunity to achieve peace and a smooth interaction among nations. Uh, the Soviet Union dissolved and all of the countries, including Russia, especially Russia, were desperate to integrate into the community of nations, uh, to, to regain the respect of the world. I know from interactions that I had with Russia that uh, they really wanted to be more like us. They wanted to be more like the West. They, they, they struggled to understand how freedom of the press worked. And they, they, they were so absolutist I spoke with the head of Gazprom, the, the great uh, oil company, and, and he said, you know, he said, we're, we're fighting the terrorists in Chechnya, and the, the terrorists make videos, they're propaganda videos, and we show them on Russian television. I said, what are you doing that for? I said, that's crazy. I said, when we fought the, the Second World War, we had total censorship. Um, I said, you don't, you don't show the, uh, the enemy's propaganda on, on your media. This is how naive the Russians were. But they, were, they wanted to be free. They wanted to have a free press. And so they did awkward things, sometimes going overboard. 
uh, to, to achieve this. What an opportunity to, you know, to bring friendship and love and harmony. But there were people who had tremendous investments of power and money in NATO. NATO had been a fine alliance during the Cold War. Excellent. But afterwards, they had no purpose. Uh, the Soviets, you know, they gave up uh, their, their alliance, their military alliance just dissolved. And so we had this massive military alliance. What do you do? You have to justify a reason for it. And you have to have an enemy. So we made an enemy of, of Russia. Russia, which was desperate to become a friend of the West. And, uh, and now, of course, we see NATO expanding around the globe. They no longer are there to defend, um, to defend uh, Europe. They're there to act aggressively to expand the global empire. And, uh, and, it's, it's, and people, you know, I, I, have a, I have a particular thing because I fought in Vietnam, I was a volunteer and I was always on the front lines in the most fierce battle. And John Bolton, who's the national security advisor to the president, was a draft dodger in Vietnam. When he was called to fight, he was a coward. He ran. Now he puffs up in his chest and he says, we've got to have war here and war there. He's a big warrior. Dick Cheney, who has probably been responsible for the deaths of perhaps millions of people, hundreds of thousands. He was a draft dodger and admitted, confessed draft dodger. But he beat his chest. He was going to be, you know, respected as the, as the, the man who, who has the courage to go to war against countries that, frankly, were not attacking us and were not a threat to us. So, there was this very dark, sinister cabal of individuals who began to emerge uh, with uh, Herbert Walker Bush. One of, the, one of the major things Herbert Walker Bush did, the, the Republican Party had been the party of peace up until that time. It was the Democrats who took us to war uh, the First World War, the Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and then all of a sudden, Herbert Walker Bush, who had been the head of the Central Intelligence Agency, not much difference than being the head of the KGB, same type of thing, he flipped it. He said, oh, you know, we now have this three-legged stool where, you know, one of the legs of conservatism is is uh, basically war. And, and then his son carried it on. And the Democrats, which had always been a war organization, except during the Vietnam where, where some of their base rose up because they were threatened with the draft. Other than that, they've always been the, the force of war. <clears throat> so now you have the Democrats who favor war, and the Republicans who favor war. There is no peace party any longer. And this is, this is a great tragedy. You have all of these neocons, the, the, you know, Dick Cheney, you have John Bolton, you have uh, Paul Wolfowitz, you have a great number of, of people with famous names and their power, their prestige comes from war. It comes from this feeling that somehow the United States is threatened by enemies from every direction, and we have to, we have to build up our military, and, uh, and there's tremendous money in this, tremendous money in all of this. We have, according to President Trump, Trump says we have spent, uh, we, we have accumulated seven trillion dollars in national debt. One third of our entire national debt has been incurred in the Middle East. 
And I cannot tell you a single positive thing that we have achieved in all of these years in the Middle East. We've, we have fought uh, the current set of wars for, what, 18 years? We have destroyed countries. We have killed probably conservatively two million people, starting in, in Libya, uh, going into Syria, well, Iraq, Iraq before that, and, and Afghanistan before that. We're now killing enormous numbers of, of Yemenis in a war that is essentially a, a continuing series of war crimes for the purpose of allowing the Saudi Arabians to put a hated Quisling in power, someone who is despised by the people of Yemen, uh, but who will do the bidding of Saudi Arabia. And uh, so we're, we're fighting wars all over, the, all over the world. We have, today, we have special operations troops in 149 countries. Most countries have American Special Operations Forces. They're involved in varying degrees. In some places, like Niger, I was going to give a, I was going to give a speech, and I was going to talk about how we've gotten so out of control, we're fighting everywhere. And I had to pull over off the road and look up uh, on Google and see what, are we fighting in Nigeria or are we fighting in the other place? And I, okay, we're fighting in the other place. It's called Niger. And then I had to look up, where is Niger? Where is this? Well, it's north of Nigeria. I know that now. But nobody knew we had troops there until there was a, a, a patrol that was ambushed, and uh, there were three American special operators who were killed. And so I had, I, I spend a lot of my time studying foreign policy, and I didn't even know the name of the country. And I bet you, if you asked a thousand Americans, do you remember Back a year or so ago, when we had a patrol that was attacked, and there were there were three soldiers killed. One one of them was a black soldier. He was prominent in the news. Some people would say, "Yeah, I kind of remember that." And then you'd ask, "What country was that?" And they'd say, "I don't know. I don't know." And then you'd say, "Have you ever heard of uh, of Niger?" No, I don't think so. Do you know where it is? Do you know what continent it's on? Well, you'd have a lot of people. It kind of sounds like it might be Africa. Some people would just guess. But people don't know where it is. Why are we fighting a war in a country whose name Americans can't even recognize? They don't know where it is on the globe. And yet we're, we're invested there. And this goes on. This is just an example of places all over. The Pentagon admits that we're at war in seven countries. These are seven distinct wars that we're fighting simultaneously. Afghanistan, uh, the drone war in Pakistan, Syria. Uh, uh, we're, still, we're still doing some military covert operations in Libya. We're in Yemen heavily. Um, we, we have bombed Iraq for 28 years. We've dropped a third of a million bombs on a country that never took any hostile action toward the United States. Amazing. It's just amazing what has happened. And we are very quickly bankrupting the country um, through what we're doing. Our military, it spends as much as the, the next 10 or 15 largest defense spenders in the world. We spend 
10 or 11 times as much as Russia does on our budget. And yet, if you ask the average person on the street who listens to the mainstream media, the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. They don't realize Russia has half of our population. Uh, Russia has an economy about the size of Italy's. It's a, it's a developed, it's a sophisticated nation, but uh, it, it is not nearly so wealthy as the United States. And uh, yet, they are the justification for NATO. We must tell all of Europe to rearm, to, to uh, increase their defense spending because of Russia. And yet, if you look at what's happening, we are moving closer and closer and closer and more provocatively towards the Russian border. I was, I was a member of the 2nd Battalion 1st Marine Regiment and it kind of broke my heart to see that they had been sent to Norway because I may be wrong and, and correct me because you're, you're the expert, but the last time that foreign troops uh, were stationed permanently in Norway was when uh, Quisling uh, took over and, and the Nazis had, uh, had invaded Norway. Now, we didn't invade Norway. We, we came in at their invitation, so it's all legal and so forth. But why does Norway need to be involved in you know, neutrality is their strength, and why do they need to be involved in a conflict with Russia? We, um, if you note, know, President Putin is a very bright man, and in addition, he is a very wise man. He's, he's measured in what he does, he's, he's very careful, and he's assisted by Ambassador Lavrov, who has just a wealth of information. He's a tremendous chess player. What you see now is we have become so threatening and people have actually openly talked about the possibility of nuclear war. And so Russia, which normally would keep secret its, its advanced weapons, they've disclosed some of what they are just as a way of telling the United States, don't do this, don't, don't think about nuclear war and destroying all of civilization because you, you need to understand that we have developed uh, hypersonic missiles that cannot be intercepted, that can hit American cities. And I think he's even going to publish the targeting list so that people in those cities say, wow, if, if these crazy people actually push Russia over the brink, then maybe our community goes down. This, this is a target right here. Loudoun County, Virginia is one of the major targets uh, in a nuclear war. I don't want a nuclear war. I have my grandchildren, I have my children here. Uh, I don't want I don't want a nuclear war that kills and murders people in Moscow or anywhere in the world. We used to be very cautious about this. During the Cold War, there was such a strict protocol between the Soviets and the United States because people instinctively understood what a nuclear war would amount to. Today, they've forgotten. Generations pass, it's okay, it's, you know. But if, if it were to break out, it would destroy human civilization. Uh, it would destroy the means of feeding people. There would be mass starvation of survivors. There would be riots that would, uh, it, it would just be, it would take us back to the dark ages. And we need to understand this. And we're, we're abandoning treaties that were entered into 
under, with such enormous effort, the, the, the efforts that were taken by very heroic people to say, okay, you can never have a treaty that's perfect, but let's have the intermediate nuclear uh, uh, treaty. Let's, let's have non-proliferation treaties so that we draw back and we, we have more distance. At the very end of the Cold War, we had, we had a thousand miles of space between East and West. And that meant that when something happened, if something came up on the radar, you had time to pick up the, the hotline to Moscow or to Washington and say, hey, we, we've detected something very strange. And the other side could say, here's what's happening. This is, this is what we see on our end. And you know, under no circumstances is this anything designed to threaten you. Now that thousand miles has become nothing, zero. And we have troops, we're, we're, running, we're running naval ships right to the edge of Russian territorial waters. We're taking nuclear capable bombers and we're, we're running towards Russia and then we turn off at the last last instant. And then when the Russians do war exercises to practice defense, we say, oh, this is provocative. It's an outrage. The, uh, the Russians are, are running war, war exercises. They're running war exercises on their own territory against people who are threatening to invade them. So it's, the situation has, has taken a very a very sinister turn. And I think there are people who recognize that our currency and our debt have reached such a level that there may come a time when we must do the most desperate things in the world to maintain our dominance and our control. And it's, it's, a, it's a very, very dark uh, cloud over human civilization. And it's something that people like you, people like me, we, we have to be able to inform people and let them know the danger that is faced by the world today.